Good morning, Shaw's Creek. Did y'all know that with the children taking up the offering for the Samaritan shoe boxes that you were just willingly robbed? <laughs> willingly robbed. Thank you for giving. Um, stand up. Take your uh, bulletin. We have a new chorus to learn this morning. We sang this uh, a couple of years ago, I guess. But So it may come back to you real quick, but let, look on the back of your bulletin, Psalm 113, and please notice who the author is, Kevin Robinson. Sing out. standing for opening prayer. Well, good morning and welcome to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. My name is Colin Taranzini. I'm the pastor here, and we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us. It is wonderful to look out and see all the smiling faces today. Uh, God is good, and, uh, and he is worthy of our praise and worship. So let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just come to you right now. In spirit and in truth, we love you. And we thank you for the day that you have given us. We thank you that we can come here and we can just worship you. Father, I pray that you would bless this congregation. I pray that you would bless this faith family. I pray that we would be able to walk out of these doors today saying, wow, we met with the Lord. And so, Father, I pray for conviction. I pray for encouragement. I pray for salvation. I pray that you would do a work that only you can provide. And God, in our midst today, we pray that we would make much of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and uh, be seated.
great job, choir, just as I am. Take your hymn book and turn to page 140. Stand up, and we're going to sing Down at the Cross. We'll sing the first and the last. Thank you so much. Well, a couple quick announcements as we continue in our time of worship. First and foremost, uh, when you received your bulletin this morning, I remember the name of the bulletin, um, but... <laughs> But when you receive the bulletin this morning in there, you should find an insert. It is a connection card. If you are a guest with us today, we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us. We know that that's not an easy task or an easy decision. And so for you to say, hey, I'm going to worship with Charles Creek Baptist Church, just fill that out. Um, that way we have a, a little bit of information and we can pray for you. You can actually put it in the offering plate um, when that gets passed by. Not only that, baptism. Next week, we are going to fill the waters. If you want to be baptized and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I do definitely need to talk to you beforehand. So find me today uh, after service. I should be out front. Come and talk to me and we can get you signed up. Not only that... But we have the Red Book Hymnal Sing. Mark your calendars. Choir practice at 445 for the Mass Choir. That's going to be Sunday, June 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, but the Red Book Hymnal Singing. You're going to want to mark your calendars and be a part of that. I believe we also have a couple other churches that are going to be here. And so we're going to do a, a corporate worship, which will be wonderful. Um, a love offering. There is a family in need. This is the last week that we're going to take up that love offering. Um, if you look in the front, you're going to see a wicker basket on the uh, 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 table there. Go ahead and uh, you can either write a check to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church and we will in turn um, give them the money. But you need to put in the memo line for that family. And so uh, we've done this for two weeks. We just want to be in prayer for that family. Um, what a wonderful church that would be able to uh, bless their congregation. And so I'm, uh, I'm actually um, blown away by that, to be honest, um, that someone in our church would come to us and, and say, uh, th we see a need and all of us together can come together to uh, make a supplication for that need. Um, today's flowers, they are placed by Robert and Rachel Ayers in honor of their anniversary. Their anniversary. Happy anniversary. Uh, anyone wishing to place flowers, please sign the calendar in the fellowship hall. Uh, the cost is $50. And then, lastly here, fellowship meal. Covered dish, 
with the church providing the meal. That's going to be Wednesday, June 1st. Uh, we will start that at 5.15. Uh, that will be followed by the Bible study and choir practice after the Bible study. Uh, but Wednesday, you don't want to miss it. We're going to have a covered dish meal. We'll have a lot of the great meats and desserts and everything you can think of. And so I'm excited for that. And I hope that you're going to come out to help us with that and, uh, and just have a time of fellowship and worship. One other announcement. On Wednesday evenings, for a while, we have been praying for a special need. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to invite Shelly Ronquilla. To, you can either uh, stay there or you can come to the front however you want to do it. But she has a praise report, and I want to celebrate with our church family. Okay, good morning. Y'all, <laughs> let me just tell you, if you don't believe in miracles or you don't know how good God is, I'm going to fix it to tell you. So, first of all, thank y'all for praying for Reagan. We really appreciate it. There's a lot of things that go on in our home that need prayer for, for Reagan, and he has been receiving that touch. Y'all know he had been in Spartanburg ER for about 42 days. And then they transferred him to William S. Hall, which is a state hospital. That's only a short term, a couple weeks, but they held him for 30 days now. But we have been praying and praying for a facility to come for him. To just give you an idea how good God is, when Reagan was accepted into Department of Special Needs and Services, they sent us a letter telling us where he was on the list for some of the special services they offer. He was, not, uh, he was number 9,570 on one group, and he was 10,767 on another group. So that gives you an idea of the need that we have for our young people. In his lifetime, he would never reach the top of that list. So our hopes were kind of getting dim. In the state of South Carolina, there are only two facilities for autism for residential treatment, only two. In the, and if you look at those numbers, 9,000 and 10,000, you could imagine the wait list to get in there. Well, our prayers were answered, and God made a miracle happen because he was accepted into Coastal Autism Academy, and he will be going there this coming week, and he will start to receive the specialized treatment that he needs, and we're hoping that this brings so much peace to his life. But we're so blessed to have this church family to pray for him and for us. Because if anybody needed it, it was this little boy. And this is a miracle for two facilities, over 10,000 on a waiting list, and he got a spot. And I thank you so much for your prayers, and praise God. Amen. Two words, but God. What we think is impossible, God shows up and he shows out and he makes a way. So we're praising God uh, with the Ronquilla family today. With that being said, I have no more announcements, so I'm going to ask Kathy to come and, and lead us in worship. Take your hymn book and turn to page 540, Saved, Saved. Isn't it good to be a child of God? And before you stand up, let me read you the first verse. I've found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lifted me and what his grace can do. Shelley's story just proved that to be true. We know that, friend. Everyone stand up and let's sing. And when we get to the saved, saved part, lift these rafters.
think about what you're singing. I love to tell how he lifted me and what his grace can do for you. Saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for The second verse, he saves me from every sin and harm, secures my soul each, each day. I'm leaning strong on his mighty arm. I know he'll guide me all. Saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. Amen. And on the last one, we're going to hold it. When poor and needy. Think about it. Come unto me, I will lead you home to live with me eternally. Sing it. Save by his power, save to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is come. Amen. Good singing. Well, as we continue in this uh, posture of worship, we are going to enter into our time of giving and offering. And so um, if I could have the ushers uh, start to come forward, that would be wonderful. I just want to say, um, you know, I don't want to forget about the privilege that you and I have to be here today. Now, we can come under this, this place of worship, and we don't have to worry about coming at night. We don't have to worry about going underground. We don't have to worry about uh, persecution. We have freedom here and in this country. And um, today we honor uh, the ultimate sacrifice uh, men and women would sign on the dotted line to go to defend our freedom. And unfortunately, not everyone made it home. And so we are honoring those men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice so we can be back here worshiping in a place of freedom. I don't want to miss that today, that we can come here today and we have freedom. And so... With that being said, uh, we are a um, member-attended, supported church. That means it's because of your faithfulness in giving that we are able to do things such as take the students to the trampoline park this past weekend. Um, and so uh, we do things such as that. We're able to uh, do the Operation Christmas Child and all the different ministries that uh, Shaw's Creek does, and it's because of your faithfulness in giving. So thank you for that. One of you brothers, would you pray?
Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James. We are going to dive into James chapter 2 today. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The title of today's message is Faith and Favoritism. Faith and Favoritism. A little bit of context. James is uh, now putting down a lot of ink in regards to one subject. So it's important that we understand what's happening here. It's also important to see how chapter 1 flows into chapter 2. Remember, when this was written by James, he didn't put chapter points, right? So everything kind of flowed together as a letter would. And so uh, the end of chapter 1, last week, uh, the last verse that we dealt with was uh, verse 27, where it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and, their, and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There is partiality being shown within the congregation that James is referencing. James is addressing the sin of partiality in the next 13 verses. So if you found your place, we'll go ahead and we'll begin to read in chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? Verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, and said, do not murder, now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder... You have become a transgressor, a transgressor of the law. So speak and do, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we're so grateful and thankful that you would bless us with this word. We just pray right now that you would encourage us, that you would convict us, that even in a message of faith and favoritism, that the gospel would spring forth and anyone who doesn't know you would hear the gospel and they would receive that gospel. I pray that you would change lives, that you would change hearts, that you would redeem us today. We love you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, was angered by an army officer who accused him of favoritism. Stanton complained to Lincoln, who suggested that Stanton write this officer a sharp letter. Stanton did and showed the strongly worded letter to the president. What are you going to do with it, Lincoln inquired. Surprised, Stanton replied, send it. Lincoln shook his head. You don't want to send that letter. He said, put it in the stove. That's what I do when I have written a letter while I am angry. It's a good letter, and you had a good time writing it. You feel better now. Now burn it and write another. Today we're going to be talking about favoritism, partiality, and prejudice. 
It's somewhat ironic that we're dealing with this today. My, uh, my brother has driven down from Vermont to grace me with his presence this Sunday. <laughs> I, um, I always try to remind my brother, though, that I am my mother's favorite. <laughs> and so, so it, th- it fits perfectly that this is where we're landing today. But in all seriousness, I want to break down this text into three different parts. So if you're taking notes, again, the title of today's message is Faith and Favoritism. Our goal and aim is to show that faith in Christ, while showing partiality, cannot coexist. So point number one, we're going to see in this breakdown of James' letter, favoritism displayed. This is verses one through three. James paints a vivid picture of how this church is acting, how they are judging others based upon an outward appearance and status rather than what God would judge them on. Partiality translates a Greek word that means literally Receiving the face. What in the world does that mean? It means that we would make judgments and distinctions based upon external considerations, such as physical appearance, social status, or race. But he gives a couple things in here that I want to point out. The example of the rich. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into... er, uh, Excuse me. Verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel. Gold rings and fine apparel. The example of the rich has a gold ring. This was one of the ways to know that this man had that status. During this timeline, they would invest a lot of money into a status that would springboard them within the community. And it would be a gold ring. So much so that people, or that stores back then, they would have stores that would rent golden rings out. So if you wanted to look the part for even a night on the town, you could swing by your local dealer, you could pick up your gold ring, and there you go. People would see you. James describes the rich with an outward appearance. The item that he has is wearing, shows a higher status which results in a better seat or more combination. <clears throat> Translate this. Contrast this against the poor. The example here is of a person with shabby clothes. Another term, shabby, is filthy. Both of these people enter the assembly. Imagine for a moment that this is Shaw's Creek Baptist Church, and both of these people enter the same time from the front door. Imagine the way that we would treat the higher up versus uh, the, the lower person in this context. What he's saying here, James is saying, that while both people would enter the assembly of God, we cater to the rich person while degrading the poor person. Now, I'm not saying that this is Shaw's Creek. But imagine if we did that. Imagine if I got the deacons together and I said, a new game plan. This week, I want all of you out in the parking lot, and I want you to write down the make, model, and year of the car that they came in. And that is where we are going to place them, right? That wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be uh, 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 something that we would do. But imagine that. This is not a kingdom thought. This is a selfish, worldly thought. When James says, to sit at my feet... This is a reference to the poor person being a slave. This is a reference to the poor person being a servant. Again, not a kingdom mindset, but a worldly one. It's based on our own gratification and not the king's. You know the king of kings and the lord of lords. And we're still placing people in categories as such based on looks, wealthy, community standing. Imagine for a moment if a celebrity came into our congregation. 
Would we treat them the same way as if we treated a homeless person that hitchhiked here from I-26? I know for me, this is one of the areas that, that I'm guilty with, right? I get starstruck so easily. Growing up, uh, I was during the timeline where um, there was uh, a show on Discovery Channel called American Chopper. And they would build these great motorcycles, and I thought, that's what I want to do when I'm older. I want to be a welder, I want to be a motorcycle builder. Well, the name is Orange County Choppers. So I had always thought that Orange County is California. And I dreamed about the day, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to visit. <clears throat> well, they weren't talking about Orange County, California. It was Orange County, New York. It was only three and a half hours away from my house. And so I convinced, I, was a, I had all the DVDs, the box sets, I had everything I wanted to be. I mean, I, I took welding classes just because I wanted to be the next Paul Sr., which is the big handlebar mustache guy, right? And so I do all of this, right? And I convince my mom and dad. I say, you got to take me out there. There's an autograph session. I want to see the motorcycles. I want to go to the store. So they do. They take me. We have a great time. We show up, and I'm thinking the whole way there, you know, what am I going to say? How am I going to, am I going to ask any questions? I get there, and, and give me grace here. I was, I was young. I couldn't even get out of the car because I was so starstruck. My mom was so upset with me. She said, we just drove three and a half hours here. You are getting your, your butt out of this car, and you are marching in there. And, 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 but, but that's me. When I put myself here, I feel like this is preaching just to me. James is speaking, though, of something that's a problem within this local congregation during this time. He gives a great deal of, of this letter to this issue. Playing favorites to the rich for personal gain. Playing favorites to the rich for, for self-image. Playing favorites to the rich for a worldly prosperity. Or just playing favorites to the rich because we still view people in a worldly sense. Friends, family, our gain is in Christ. Our image is in Christ and our prosperity is in Christ. That's the name of the game that we can uh, that James can confront a congregation of people that have been called out that have been redeemed by the gospel that it has changed and transformed their lives and they're saying why are you putting these people on a pedestal when we know the king of glory? So, we see Favoritism displayed. Our next point, favoritism detested. Verses 4 through 7. Favoritism detested. Making distinctions reveals a, our lack of holiness. James says it right here. We have, when we have a prejudice and make those distinctions, the Bible is clear that we have become judges with evil desires. Imagine you and I being considered a judge with evil desires. Tell a quick story. There was a Supreme Court judge by the name of James McReynolds. During this time that women were finally allowed to vote, McReynolds was known for his hate. When attorney Charles Hamilton Houston came before the Supreme Court to represent a plaintiff in one of the most important civil rights cases in history, McReynolds rose to the occasion by swiveling his chair around 180 degrees to turn his back to Houston. The reason? Houston happened to be an African American. McReynolds was never subtle about his hatred for people of color or Jewish people regardless of their social stature, when Louis Brandeis became the first Jewish justice appointed to the court in 1916, McReynolds refused to speak to him, sit next to him, or even acknowledge the existence for years. He wasn't that polite to Benjamin Cardozo, the second ever court nominee as well. While Cardozo was even being sworn in, McReynolds took out a newspaper and began reading it in the middle of the ceremony. 
probably planting his feet up on the bench, then muttering something about another one. This was after he had already broken the rules by writing then-President Hoover about Cardozo, begging him to not afflict the court with another one, with another Jew. Think about that just for a moment. That was 1916. That was only 100 years ago. Think about that. And so I, I, I tell that story because I go to James and that's what I think about for myself and for what James is saying here within the assembly of God, within the family, that they were still thinking in a kingdom mindset. Folks, the kingdom of God doesn't have a white only or a black only water fountain. The kingdom of God isn't separated by different cliques and groups. The kingdom of God will not have a poor section of town. The kingdom of God is a multi-generational, multi-ethnical uh, group under the headship of Christ. We will all be singing worthy, worthy, worthy with people uh, that when on the earth made up different ethnicity, culture, and socioeconomic status. James asks a question in verse 6, though. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Time out. He's not saying, and I don't want anyone to think that just because you have money, it, it means that you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Whether you are poor or whether you're rich, whatever it is, it's by faith alone in Christ alone that you have salvation. Okay? And so understand that. But during this time, what James is finding in the cultural context is that the rich would take part, uh, they would take people to court and knew the system so well that they would get land and money from the people. The rich knew the law and the courts to the, uh, and took advantage so much so to gain more for themselves and line their own pockets. Do not think for a moment Right, Because I'm coming up here, and what we're doing is we're doing expositional preaching, verse by verse, book by book, going through it. So I didn't come up with this message. Essentially, this message is already presented by itself. I'm just pointing it out because I'm being faithful to the text. I do not want you to think for a moment, though, that um, you have hired only three months ago someone from Vermont, and uh, you know all of a sudden I'm getting up here and I'm, I'm talking about, quote-unquote, eating the rich as the uh, political slogan is. Don't think that I'm, I'm going for a 21st century political system when I'm talking about this, because I'm not. What I'm talking about is I'm going back here, and what they're saying is that the rich of this time were very affluential. They knew the courts. They knew the, the, the judges. They knew the lawgivers. And by the end of it, there was a, a, a gain for them. Also, Making distinctions reveals our lack of understanding. We lack our understanding in who God is and what the Word says. There is a theological principle to all of this as well. That scripture is saturated with the understanding that God gave faith to the poor. This is part of that upside-down kingdom. God has chosen the poor to have a special place in God's economy of salvation. Luke 6, 20 and 21, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. 1 Corinthians 1.27 But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Think about this. David is the one who kills Goliath. Josiah becomes king at the age of eight years old and he restores the law. Mary a young virgin, not from a castle, not from wealth, not from prosperity, not from a high status, is called to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Shepherds are the one invited to see the newborn king. Twelve below average people are the ones to follow him. Two women are the ones to echo the statement that he has risen. 
Paul, a Jew who has a, a crucial part of the first martyrdom in history, writes half of the New Testament. God uses the poor and the average and the weak to accomplish His purpose, and we should all be thankful for that. We should. That He uses average men and women to accomplish His great plans. John 7, 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So it's a lack of understanding on our part because that is not what God cares about. The outward appearance, the fine clothes, the riches of this world, God looks deeper than the outward appearance and He looks to the heart. Imagine if you and I could have the eyes of God for just a day where we saw what God saw in men and women and not what the world sees. Wow. And it's also a good reminder. Even the Son of Man had no place to lay His head. It is detested by James because it doesn't reflect the heart and the character of God. Lastly, we see favoritism dismissed. The cure for our prejudices, our favoritism, is the gospel. It's for us to realize that Christ showed no partiality when he came to this world to save a rebellious bunch. It's when we look at the fact that Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, and yet he has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. When we think of favoritism and prejudice in light of the gospel, we have no leg to stand on. And because Christ has fulfilled the law, going into the last little bit of what we, what we read, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. It keeps going down and going down. The royal law that is mentioned there, the law of liberty, which is found in Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The royal law is referring to God's command in Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus isn't the only place where we have seen the royal law. Matthew 22.36-40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. To love. I want all of us to stop just for a moment and think to ourselves, what do we do for ourselves? And this is me, okay? I can't talk for anyone else. What, What do I do for myself versus what do I do for my neighbor? I make sure my belly is full. I make sure my bank account is full. I make sure my, my uh, gas tank is full. Not right now, but close. <laughs> I make sure my Roth IRA is full. I make sure my hair is cut. I make sure my oil is changed. I make sure I have new clothes. I make sure that I'm taking good things in spiritually, physically, and emotionally. I listen to the music that I want. I enjoy the parkway or the creek by my house. I do all this for who? For me. For me. Because it brings me sustenance. Because it brings me happiness. I fail in this category. You want to talk about living radical in 2022 when everything nowadays is non-social and at the touch of your hand when people are walking around with phones in their faces. When it's the me, me, me motto. And when it's the instant gratification world, imagine going and serving and loving your neighbor. Imagine building bridges with them. Imagine if we looked around this room in a year from now and it was filled with neighbors of all of us right now. 
Because we went out and we served them and we helped them and we befriended them and we gave them the gospel and we invited them to church. Whew! That would be amazing. And I could stop looking at this empty section up here. <laughs> Keeping the royal law. The law of Christ. It's our duty and obligation to love our neighbors. It's our duty to serve them sacrificially. We see Jesus, God incarnate, come to this world not to be served, but to serve. If we are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven and are called to re represent our king well, then why do we make the mistake of playing favorites and discriminating and showing prejudice? And lastly, I love the word. I love the saying found in 13. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This can be interpreted as a statement about the relative weight of two attributes of God. The point being that God rejoices in being able to overcome His judgment with His mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The idea is that mercy glories or boasts against judgment. Knowing that where mercy and judgment seem to conflict, mercy wins. And the good news for every child of God in Christ is that God's mercy toward us will triumph over His judgment of us. Our sins may argue against us, but Christ is our loving advocate who argues for us and prevents us from receiving the judgment that you and I deserve. We, in turn, display God's type of mercy toward others. Romans 8.1 is a great reminder how mercy triumphs over judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk away according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's because the blood of the Lamb that we can love our neighbors. It's because of His death on the cross that we can celebrate His mercy over judgment. To end with a couple quick applications today. First and foremost, I want you to know that everything I say, once again, is rooted in a foundation of the gospel. James, you're going to find out real quick if you haven't already. James is an action-packed do-do-do book, right? It is, hey, get out there. It's the Christian life, so to speak, and things that we should take on as Christ followers. Don't think for a second that I'm getting up here and I'm telling a bunch of uh, uh, people who don't know Christ to act as if they do have Christ. That's not what I'm doing. This starts from an overflow from the foundation that you and I are sinful people and we deserve death, hell, and the grave, but God, being gracious in His mercy, decided to give us Jesus Christ that He would go to the cross and die for you and for me. That while on the cross, I say it again and again, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's that mercy. That's where it's rooted. And the overflow is what we get in the book of James. The action-packed Christian lifestyle that you and I get to live because we are ambassadors of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So first and foremost, it starts out with a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are today, but I do know this, that you at the end of your life will die. I know that's morbid, but you will. And you will uh, go in front of a holy and righteous God, and He will either say, Father, or He will either say, Depart from me, for I never knew you, or Well done, thy good and faithful servant. It's because of the gospel that you and I can stand up here today. It's because of the gospel that we can read the book of James. It's because of the gospel that we can talk about favoritism. Because if we didn't have the gospel, then the world would, we would live like the world and we would play favorites. 
It's rooted in the gospel. But understand a couple things. Favoritism and prejudice reveal evil thoughts according to God. Secondly, favoritism and prejudice are contrary to God's ways. Thirdly, favoritism is incompatible with the law of Christ. Fourthly, the gospel has made a way for us to love and serve our neighbors the way God intends for us to. We have the hope of the world, and it's Jesus. Jesus showed no partiality to you and to me. Why would we show partiality to someone else? As I close today, I want you to think about this thought with me. It was a thought that I... It's a fictional thought, but I think it does us well to understand it. Imagine at the end of our life, when we go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he, he looks, and he, and, he, and he says, I want you to watch a video. And in this video, it's everyone that you and I missed. It's you and I missing all these people based upon our own prejudices, our own wants, our own thoughts. Imagine that for just a moment. That we get there and we get this highlight reel, so to speak, of the people that didn't look like us, act like us, smell like us, talk like us. The people that thought a little bit differently or voted a little bit differently. The people that, uh, you know, decided to wear a mask versus the people that didn't decide to wear a mask because that was a big thing. Whatever it may be, think about that for just a moment. Imagine if we could be confronted by them for just a moment. You knew? You had the hope of the world and you didn't tell me? I was with you so many times. I've passed you in the hallways. I've talked to you. We had great conversations about gardening and music and sports and everything else. Why didn't you give me the thing that mattered? We are ambassadors of the kingdom. But that all starts and it's rooted with a foundation. Your and my foundation needs to be in Christ. While Kevin comes and plays, I'm going to give just an, a quick opportunity. I'm going to transfer a little bit, and I'm just going to ask this very question. I'm going to ask, do you know him? Because before I can read James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and before I could ever pray that you and I could get it, and that we could obtain it and really dig it into our lives and live it out, before we could ever do that, we need to know for certain that we are truly ambassadors, that we are truly representatives. If you don't know, I want to give an opportunity. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, do you need Jesus this morning? Do you need the Savior of the world who would take on flesh to come to this place to live a sinless life and die on a cross for you and for me? Do you need that? Do you know that you know that you know that you are secure in Christ? Or maybe today you're thinking to yourself, gee, I've heard Jesus' name. I know some Bible stories, but I have never placed my faith, put my hope, put my trust in Jesus. If that's you today and you want to know Jesus in a personal, relational way, every head is bowed right now. I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up in the air. And then for, for all of us today that are foundationally rooted in Christ, I don't know if this message, it's certainly an applicable message. I don't know if it pierces to your heartstrings. But I'm going to leave these altars open. My goal is that we would love on our neighbors well, that we would serve them well, and that Shaw's Creek would be a multi-generational, multi-ethnical church 
that would worship one Savior, King Jesus. If you want to come up to the altar to pray, I want to give time for that as well. These altars are open. If I can pray for you for any reason, uh, feel free to come. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you that we can say that we are children of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That we can say that you have adopted us, that we are heirs, that we have a home, a place that you have prepared for us. Father, I pray that we would have two missions in our life. That we would make disciples of all nations and we would try to overpopulate heaven. Allow us to feel that zeal and that fire and allow us to go from here and serve our community well. We love you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. With that being said, um, June 1st, we have the the, uh, Wednesday night, 515, bring a side dish, let's have a meal together, let's worship the Lord and have some fellowship. And with that, uh, I love each and every one of you. The church is not the steeple, but the people. Go and be the church. God bless. The Lord, uh, the